And so, allow me to pick it from there and uh, introduce a message that I've titled The Crossed Hands of Blessing. The Crossed Hands of Blessing. I want to take a spark to where it began. And then I will bring you to Calvary and then to resurrection and then to how you can appropriate this message in your life. The crossed hands of blessings. The crossed hands of blessing. I'm reading from, from the book of Genesis chapter 48. Genesis 48 from verses 17 to 19. And this is what the word of God says. It's posted up there. It's just posted up there. We can, we can read it together. Allow me to read it. It says, when Joseph saw that his father laid his hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father. Since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He said, he also shall be a people and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of the nations. Father Lord, as I bring your word, I pray for clarity of communication. I pray that these words are anointed and that the, my audience are anointed to hear the message of the Lord and to appropriate the message of the Lord into their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, this is an excerpt from uh, the book of Genesis. The story is about Jacob. Jacob is on his deathbed. And uh, a word reaches Joseph that dad is sick. Back then, the children of Israel had settled. They had settled in a place called Goshen in Egypt. They had settled there, and uh, uh, Joseph was a high-ranking official in the government of Pharaoh. And so a word reaches him that your dad at Goshen is sick to a point of almost dying. And so Joseph rushes. He comes, and with him, he brings two of his sons, two of his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, children that were born in Egypt to an Egyptian mother. And so Jacob arrives, and his father asks, who are these? Who are these? They are dressed like Egyptians. They look like Egyptians. They speak like Egyptians. They are literally Egyptians. Who are these? And Joseph says, these are my sons. These are my sons. It is at that point that Jacob adopts them. He adopts the two sons of Joseph who were born in Egypt. He adopts them and he says, they will be my children. What, 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 what Jacob meant with that was that they, are, they were going to be primary, primary in hairs of his blessing. They were going to be partakers of his blessing. He, 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 he literally adopted them as his son. What that means was that Joseph, Joseph was going to get double blessing. And have you realized that Joseph doesn't appear among the 12 tribes of, 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 of Israel? Literally, Joseph appears among the 12 tribes of Israel as Manasseh and Ephraim. It, has, it, is, it was at this point that Joseph's name was removed and replaced with Manasseh and Ephraim. And so, Joseph, Joseph is going to be blessed through Ephraim and Manasseh. But something happens. 
something happens. The prayer of blessing was supposed to be done. And so, Joseph brings his sons, Ephraim, on, on the right hand, so that the right hand would go to the left hand of Jacob. And the right hand holding Manasseh, so that the right hand would go to, I mean, the left hand of Joseph holding Manasseh, so that the left hand would go to Moses' right hand. And that was the order. And so Joseph brought two, his, two of his sons. He brought them. And he knelt down and bowed his head. And while doing that, the prayer of blessing started. Jacob switched his hands. He switched his hand. So that the right hand was on Ephraim and the left hand was on Manasseh. And prayer began. All this a while, Joseph's head was down. Jacob made one prayer. He made one prayer, blessing them. And so, while they were just about to say, Amen, Joseph lifted up his head. And so, that daddy's hand was, the right hand was on Ephraim, and the left hand was on Manasseh. And Joseph said, no, it's not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to be this way. My firstborn is Manasseh. Place your right hand on his head and your left hand on Ephraim because Ephraim is the youngest. That was supposed to be the order. That was supposed to be the order. And so, we are asking ourselves, you know, we are now asking ourselves, what was the significance of Joseph's, Jacob's crossed hand? Was it really important that Jacob had to cross his hand to bless these children. What was the significance of Jacob's crossed hands? What was the significance? Now, Jacob did what was a reflection of, you know, what Jacob did was a reflection of what God would do for us on the cross of Jesus. It was a reflection of what God would do for us on the cross of Jesus. Through Jacob, through Jacob, God spoke of how he will work the story of redemption. Through the crossed hand, God was speaking. God was saying something. And so, the crossed hands signified a spiritual transaction. There was a legal proceeding that took place, you know, at the deathbed of Jacob and at Calvary. There was a legal proceeding. At, the, at, at, at Jacob's deathbed, there was a transfer of responsibility. A transfer of responsibility. The right hand meant transfer of responsibility. From that point in time, Ephraim walked with the authority of Jacob. From that time, the patriarch released released his authority to this young, you know, Ephraim. There was a transfer of double portion. There was a transfer of birthright. Ephraim took the place of Reuben. Reuben, something had happened with him. And so Ephraim took the place of Reuben. And, as, and, 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 and Manasseh, the place of Simon. And so, um, the blessing, there was a transaction that happened at Jacob's bed, and the same transaction transferred, you know, just a picture. You know, we are talking about, we are talking about a type. This was a type that was going to happen at the cross of Jesus. At the cross of Jesus, Jesus took our sin. God crossed his hand. At the cross at Calvary, God crossed his hand. The blessings of Jesus came on us and our curses went on Jesus. God crossed his hand so that the righteousness of Jesus came on us. Our curses, our sin went on Jesus. At Calvary, at Calvary, he who knew no sin 
was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The cross hand of Jacob signified that the older would serve the younger. That the older would do what? Serve the younger. Did Jesus serve us? Yes, he did. Jesus, our elder brother, served us with his life. With his life. On, on, on Friday, our senior pastor preached about the donkey. The donkey was given honor. Jesus gave honor to what was not. When everybody thought the horse deserved honor, when everybody else thought that a bigger donkey would have been better, Jesus chose what was not. A donkey, a baby donkey. And Jesus gave that baby donkey honor. That Jesus did on, on, on Calvary. We who were not, we who were useless, we who did not deserve honor, were given honor. Jesus gave us honor. Jesus gave us honor. Our elder brother, Jesus, served us with his love, with his life. He served us with his death on the cross. Jesus served us with his death on the cross. When Satan thought that he was dealing a deadly blow to Jesus, making him to carry a heavy cross around the streets of Jerusalem on his way to Calvary, the devil thought that he was dealing Jesus a deadly blow. What he did know was that Jesus was serving us. Jesus was serving us to the point of death. He served us with his resurrection. We just saw a while ago through the drama, Jesus is alive. And, he, did, you know, we are not talking about a case where he keeps on, you know, resurrecting every year. <laughs> he, he rose once. Praise the Lord. He rose once, and today he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. Praise the Lord. He is interceding for us. Are you excited? Are you excited that the Lord Jesus Christ is not just sitting in heaven? He is also interceding for you. Praise the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen and is seated at the right hand side of the Father, interceding for us. The crossed hands of Jacob could not be reversed. They could not be reversed. The crossed hand stayed like that. Jacob, I mean, Joseph tried to, 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 to you know, revert, to bring it back to, you know, what he had thought. But Jacob said, no, this is the right order. This is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's supposed to be. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God chose us by his good pleasure. God was not coerced in loving us, he loved us by his good pleasure. God's blessing fall to those he is pleased to give. And so, just like Ephraim and Manasseh, you and I were lost as a people outside the covenant. You and I were lost, you know, as a people outside the covenant until we were adopted to God's family. Are you excited that you've been adopted in God's family? You know, Ephraim and Manasseh were Egyptians, literally. They looked like Egyptians. And Jacob was, was even, who are these? Who are these? They were dressed like Egyptian. They were born of a, an Egyptian mother. Their, their mother, you know, Joseph had married a daughter of a priest, a priest who was serving idols, a priest who was serving in an idol's temple. And the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim was a priest of idols. These children who are born from a mother who worships idol are brought in the family of Jacob 
the family that has a covenant with God and they are adopted and given a place of honor. That is what Jesus did for us. We didn't deserve. We didn't deserve. We didn't deserve salvation. Salvation belonged to Jews. Salvation belonged to Jews. But God, by his mercy, brought us in. If there are people who must never question God's sovereign authority on redemption, then those people are we, the genders, who were once relegated but now have been reinstated. We, the genders, should never question the authority, God's authority on redemption. Utaona watu wengine 25 years old wanapiga kelele kwa barabara. Oh, we want to go. We are atheist. We are atheist. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. God. God. You know, the Bible, uh, the word of God talks about we being, you know, we have just been, uh, you know, like, like, you know, grafted. We've been grafted. We were grafted in. God's mercy grafted us into the family of God. And so, Jacob's crossed hands symbolized God's irrational love, unreasonable love. You, you, you know, there is no, you cannot place reason around how God loved us. The word of God says in Romans chapter 5 verses 8, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners languishing in immorality, languishing in jealousy, languishing in lie, hatred, alcoholism, self-ambition, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus paid it all. There is no sin that was not paid for. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid for the sin of, Jesus paid for sin and shame. Jesus paid for disgrace and distress. Jesus paid for pain and grief. Jesus paid for your past mistakes and rejection. Through the crossed hands of Jacob, God signified his unprompted love. Nobody can prompt God's love. Human beings know how to prompt love. We prompt love by makeups. You apply makeup so that you can prompt life, love. We prompt love by our words. We prompt love. God cannot be prompted to love us more. You cannot prompt God to loving you. God's love cannot be influenced. We know of people who are influenced. Many things, you know, business partners can influence you. You know, your environment can influence you. God cannot be influenced to love us. You cannot influence God to love you. God's love is uncost. You cannot cause God to love you more. The Bible says that his character, the, his nature is love. God is love. God is love. And that is his nature. We cannot coerce God. We cannot make him to love us more or less. You know, it's, it's undoable. We cannot, we cannot coerce God into loving us. The crossed hands of Jacob symbol, uh, symbolized God's unlimited love. The crossed hand of Jacob symbolized God's unlimited love. The whole world, the entire population of the world can enjoy God's love. It is unlimited. The entire population, the whole world, even those ones that you feel cannot. Those, you know, we're talking about those terrorists that we have, we've always ruled out of the book. Even those ones, God's love can reach them. The book of John 3.16. And today I want to teach us something, a very, very profound way of reading John 3.16. This is how we normally read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him 
should not perish but have eternal life. That's how we normally read it. For God so, for God so loved the world. Let me teach you another way of reading John 3.16. Uh, and I love the way Swahili says, Kwa maana jinzi hi. You know, we normally read that. For God saw, like God fell in love with the world. Like God loved sin. God has never loved sin. This is how we are supposed to read John 3.16. For God saw. Or, you know, for God saw. Or for so God. Okay? Put a comma. This can be, interpret can be interpreted like, for in this manner, God. Okay? It's not that God loved the world so much. It is like, for in this manner, God. Okay? For in the, to this extent, God. Okay? For in this aspect, God. For through this method, God. And it goes on. For this is how God loved the world. That he gave. Through this method, God loved the world. That he gave. Through this aspect, God loved the world. That he gave. Praise the Lord. And so the giving aspect is what describes the love of God. It is not that God fell in love with, you know, the domain of sin. It is that God, you know, the love of God was expressed in this way. And so let me do an illustration here. A story is told. A story is told of a certain man who worked at an intersection. An intersection where maritime traffic was passing uh, down, you know, uh, through a section, you know. And uh, over the bridge was a, tra a train line passing on top over the bridge. Down maritime traffic, up the train. And so this man's work was to coordinate. This man's work was to coordinate smooth traffic of both the maritime vessels, ships that were crossing that point and uh, a train that was crossing over the bridge. This man's work was to open the bridge, open the bridge when a big ship wanted to cross through that section. But his work also was to cross the bridge so that a train, a train would cross over that section. And so the work of this man was to coordinate a smooth flow, a smooth flow of both maritime traffic and a train crossing over from above. He had his cabin set just, you know, somewhere around there. And so his work was, as I've explained, quite often this man would bring his son along, a good father. He would once at a, at a time bring his son along so that, you know, uh, the desire and, uh, you know, something would be built in his son about the job. And so, the child, the seven years, would see his dad press buttons. He would press this button and the, the bridge would open. He would press this button and the bridge would close. He would press another one and the tracks would adjust. And so, the, that, that, the seven-year-old enjoyed, enjoyed daddy's job. And so, one day, the tracks were down. And daddy responded to the call of nature. Daddy responded to the call of nature. He went out and he left his son there. You know, um, a curiosity had been developing in the seven years old. You know, what, when will dad allow me one day to sit here and operate things? And so the, the opportunity presented itself. And so that young boy pressed a button and he said, wow, I can even go further and enjoy, enjoy a ride. And so he pressed the opening button and the bridge was opening. And he ran outside and climbed on the bridge and the bridge took him all the way up. All the way up. Oh, it was fun. It was fun. You know, the boy was enjoying, uh, you know, 
something that daddy has never discovered. You know, this can be a playground. We can, you know, daddy had not discovered something about, you know, the bridge carrying somebody and taking him all the way up. And so the son went up there. And while up there, a hooting, pop, 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 a hooting was heard. Again, pop, pop, pop. And dad knew that that was an alarm. Dad knew that was an alarm. And he thought for a while, was, were the trucks down? Were the trucks down? And so he came running. He came running into the cabin and found the trucks up. And up on, the, on, 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 on one of the, the, the ladders, his son is up there sitting. Daddy, how are you? And nightmare, daddy's not, not, that was the worst day. Daddy is hearing the train coming at full speed. And his son is waving, daddy, hello. Daddy knew, dad knew that one option has to be taken. Sacrifice my son to save thousands on the cross. Or save my son and kill thousands, you know, on the train. Sacrifice my son to save thousands who are in the train. Or save my son to kill the thousands who are on the train. It is at that point when dad was just about to do, to, to, I don't know which one, to praise that the screens went off. And a word came there. What would you do? What would you do? The same question was presented to God. And God decided that your life and my life mattered. His son's life had to go. God sacrificed the life of his lovely begotten son so that you and I could be saved. And so that verse again, for God so loved the world, for in this manner, for through this demonstration, God loved the world. For this is how God loved the world. And so we are talking about salvation. We are talking about salvation. Let me, let me just throw a caveat, caveat in your mind. Salvation is not a ticket that you receive on submitting or on, on, on releasing your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It, salvation is not a ticket that you receive so that one day you will enter heaven. You know, to go and watch sports. Salvation is not a ticket that you receive so that one day you will enter heaven. Salvation is a package. Salvation is a package. The Greek word for salvation is sozo. S-O-Z-O. Sozo, which means to keep safe, sound from danger to keep safe and sound from danger. And I will explain something on that. I will explain something on that. Salvation, sozo, sozo is a package. It's a package. For some of us who normally receive packages during Easter holidays like today, during our birthdays, during Christmas, some of us who normally receive a package, a package. When you are given a package, inside the package, there are many things. There are normally many things inside a box that you're given. And so salvation is a box. It's a package. It's a package. And so when you're talking about salvation, we are talking about you receiving healing, divine healing. When you're talking about you being saved, we are talking about you receiving deliverance. When you're talking about salvation, we are talking about you receiving restoration. And that's what the word sozo means. The word that we translate to our English word, salvation. It means healing. It means deliverance. It means restoration. It means preservation. It means protection. It means peace. Come on. Salvation is not just a ticket to enter heaven. When you say that I'm saved, you're saying that I'm protected. When you're saying that I'm saved, you're saying that I'm healed. When you're saying that I'm saved, you're saying that I'm delivered. You're saying that I'm restored. You're saying that I'm preserved. You're saying that I'm protected. You're saying that I've received divine peace. 
the peace of God that cannot be measured. That is what salvation means. And so next time when you tell your friend, I'm saved, it's just one word that means I have this entire package. I have this whole package. Praise the Lord. Can you, do you want to celebrate Jesus for that? Do you want to celebrate Jesus for that? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so God, God, for God so loved the world, he did not choose us selectively. He did not choose us selectively to enjoy his love. He loved the world. He did not choose us by color. He did not choose us by race. He did not choose us by tribe. He loved everybody. Everybody. Everybody can enjoy the salvation, the benefit of the blood of Jesus. The cross, on the cross, God paid for every sin except one. God paid for every sin except one. The sin of choice. The sin of choice, you will watch you. You have to make your own decision to follow the Lord. You know, people, you've heard this narrative that everybody in the world is saved. Everybody, Jesus died for everybody. Everybody is saved. No, 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 not everybody is saved. The Bible says, for whosoever, a place of choice. There is a place of choosing. The Lord has presented the package, but it's up to you to decide, I want it or I want to reject it. The choice was left to you. And so the biggest sin that is taking people to hell is not the sin of immorality. The biggest sin that is taking people to hell is not the sin of, you know, uh, that you can mention. Those sins don't take people to hell. The sin that takes people to hell is the attitude problem. The attitude problem on not deciding to follow Jesus. When you start saying, how are you, you know, I, when you start forming reasons around why you don't want to follow Jesus, that is the beginning of going to hell. When you have reason as to why you don't want to receive Jesus, that is an excuse that Jesus did not die for. The sin of choice, the sin of rejecting Jesus, is the sin that is taking many people to hell. The sin of not committing your life to Jesus. The sin of saying, I don't want the forgiveness of sin. I've rejected it. I don't want. No, thank you. That sin of saying, no, thank you to Jesus. That is the sin that takes people to hell. And so, my brothers and sisters, as we bring this to a close, I want to declare to us today that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. The redemption story doesn't end by Jesus dying. The redemption story ends by triumphant comeback. There was a triumphant comeback. Praise the Lord. The difference between Jesus and Muhammad is that Jesus died. Muhammad died. Muhammad remained dead. The difference between Jesus and Hare Krishna is that Jesus died and Hare Krishna, Krishna died. Hare Krishna, Krishna remained dead. The difference between Jesus and Buddha is that Buddha died and he remained dead. The difference between Jesus and Ondeto is that Ondeto died and he remained dead. The difference between Jesus and Jehovah Wanyonyi is that Jehovah Wanyonyi died and he remained dead. The difference between Jesus and another guy from Tongareni is that that guy will one day die and he will remain dead. But Jesus is alive. Come on. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And so on Friday, on Friday of, 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 of crucifixion, the devil and his demons were celebrating. It was done. It was dark. And from the foundations of the world, the word was written. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That was the word from long time ago. And so the writing was, wa, Jesus defeated Satan. But because it was, it was dark, Satan and his demons read, Jesus defeated. They were not seeing the other side. And they were celebrating. You know, when they were dragging Jesus 
on the streets of Jerusalem, taking him to Calvary. They were seeking, Jesus defeated, Jesus defeated. And so they took him up there, they crucified him, and they were singing, Jesus defeated, Jesus defeated. They didn't know that Sunday was coming. Sunday was coming. It was a Friday, and Sunday was coming. And so, they kept on celebrating. The Bible says, Jesus went down there and defeated Satan and made him a public spectacle. Do you know what that means? Jesus did not just slap him a few slaps. Jesus defeated him completely and picked him, you know, and started walking around with him, showing him to his demons. Your master is here, he's defeated. He made a public spectacle of him. And that's why in the name of Jesus, when you mention the name of Jesus, demons bow. They know that man. They understand that man. That man beat our master. He beat him properly and made a public display of him. That is the meaning of why when you say in the name of Jesus, demons flee. They know that name. They know that name. And so Jesus is alive. Praise the Lord. Jesus is alive. On a Sunday morning, they went out and he was alive. The writings were clear. Jesus defeated Satan. Jesus defeated Satan. Praise the Lord. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. I'm bringing this to a closure. And I want to pray with somebody who says, I want to receive the peace of God. The crossed hand of God is now opened. It was once crossed, but now the hands of God are opened. God wants to restore his image in somebody. The Holy Spirit of God is pleading with somebody, you know, to speak peace, to speak rest in his life. The Lord wants to give somebody rest. We've said that salvation is not just a ticket that you receive so that one day you will end it. Salvation is a package. Somebody saying that I want restoration. Somebody saying that I want peace in my family. Somebody saying that I've been rejected. I want restoration. That is a package that comes with salvation. And so I want to pray with somebody. I want to pray that God will lift your guilt, that God will lift your fear, that the Lord will give you a satisfaction for your craving heart that the Lord will meet you.